it's my pleasure at this point in time to uh, introduce my, the, my colleague, friend, and co-director, Professor Katsarkov, who will introduce the first speaker of the evening. Thank you, Steve. So once again, thank you all for coming. And so our first speaker today is Professor Mina Teicher. So Mina is uh, educated by the first wave of top Russian algebraic geometers who moved to Israel, like Boris Moishezon and Ilya Petesky Shapiro. So they very quickly moved to the United States, but she sized the moment and was <laughs> so got her education in Israel while they were there. So eventually they became professors in Columbia in Yale University. Uh, and uh, her early work included the solution of well-known uh, conjecture of algebraic surfaces, so-called watershed conjecture, where together with Moishezon, they develop a technique of ray factorization, which today is uh, quite used in uh, symplectic geometry. So uh, Mina later moved to uh, more applied topics, and you'll hear more about uh, uh, these uh, topics today. But let me just say that this is one of the many different kinds of works uh, she does, not only in mathematics, but in all kinds of uh, uh, general uh, society involvements. So probably I have never seen a mathematician that works with politicians on such a level. So actually I overheard co conversation between her and Ariel Sharon in the old days. Luckily I don't speak any Hebrew. So I mean, I was a part of the Israeli government at that time. And then uh, she communicates and, uh, with people like uh, Michael Bloomberg, uh, George Bush Jr. and uh, uh, Bill Clinton, I've seen the picture, so I can guess for that. So in fact, uh, she serves on many committees in Europe uh, connected with uh, ERC and uh, uh, all kinds of European foundations. And so she can be seen also as a certain type of a 21st century Gertrude Bell, who is probably the, uh, well known for her connections with uh, Arabic countries in the 19th century. In fact, in my humble opinion, if Mina was to involved in the solution of the Middle East crisis, there will be no more Middle East crisis. <laughs> so let me reflect on you, Mina Teicher, who is going to tell us about math in nature. introduction, it's more than that. I'm sorry my mother is dead too. <laughs> but, uh, thank you for inviting me and giving me the chance to, to uh, speak here. Uh, it's really uh, a great uh, honor. And I don't have much time, so I will talk generally, even though I wanted to <laughs> reflect to some of your remarks. Math and Nature is the title of the talk, but ma the message that I want to give is that mathematics is everywhere, really everywhere. And uh, when I say everywhere, it's in God-made and in man-made uh, entities. So when we talk about nature, uh, you need mathematics if you want to study shapes and structures of different entity, live and, and still. Uh, if you want to try to understand processes, I mean to understand the physical world, global warming, how does the brain work, cognitive processes. And when we come to biomedicine, which is one of the titles of this uh, series of talk, you need mathematics if you want to identify and cure medical uh, conditions like those that are uh, listed, uh, listed here. But you also, mathematics is also everywhere in man-made. Uh, you need mathematics to study architecture and art, to design buildings and products, and to go into space or to develop artificial vision and smart cities, a health system, financial market, mass transportation, and of course the computer of the future. We heard a lot about quantum computer. and cyber security, which is the main goal now of many, many countries and many private uh, companies. This is the threat to humanity. So without mathematics, you cannot face cyber security. But you cannot talk about everything uh, in 45 minutes. So I will uh, concentrate on nature 
And even then, I cannot talk about everything which is uh, there. So I'm choosing, I chose uh, a list of topics from this uh, nature. Um, you see the list of topics here. I will not read it, but uh, you come to it every moment. I just want to say that this is, uh, that I might uh, disappoint my mathematical friends because this is a public uh, lecture, but so I'm not talking about how, I'm just talking about what, but any mathematician that wants to understand the how later, I'd be more than happy to, to explain. So this is, uh, and the last general remark that I'm very glad that the Hemisphere Institute is taking upon itself this public uh, talks because reaching the audience is not only service to the audience, it's also service to mathematics because these people from the public are sometimes those that give money and sometimes they are the, the clients of what we are uh, doing. And very nice that the two first speakers are female. This is also, I appreciate very much. I think it's part of the Hemisphere Institute mission. Okay, so I start with the first series of uh, examples of Mars and mathematics describes nature. So the first one that I take is the golden section, which is very uh, familiar notion for a lot of uh, a lot of people, and uh, this is actually just a number. Even though you heard a lot, you saw movies this and that, it's a number. One point one six. No, 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 just one six. Made a mistake in the number? Yeah, it was not the second one, yeah. 1.6. Ah, okay, okay, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it will appear again because I copied. So, <laughs> so uh, this number, uh, why is such a number? It's not even a rational number, and, uh, and there are all these dots there that uh, sometimes it's not easy to understand what are they coming from. So, where does this number come from? Uh, it comes from a rectangle. You take a rectangle that the, uh, the longer um, side and the shorter side have a certain property. The property is that the longer divided by the shorter one is the, the sum of both of them, B plus C, divided by B. And the claim is, ah no, it wasn't uh, copied. And the claim <laughs> is uh, that B over C, uh, equal b plus c over b, if this uh, certain relation between the size of the edges satisfy that, then b over c, the number is 1.618. And um, this is very easy. The proof is very easy. This may be the last mathematical you see. It's uh, some type, something from junior high. If b over c equals b plus c over b, then we open the bracket and we call b over c x, and then we multiply everything by x, so we get a quadratic equation. And if we solve this quadratic equation by the well-known formula, we get that x is 1 plus square root of 5 over 2, which is 1.618, and zero, and that's where the dots are coming from, because the square root of 5 is not a rational number, so there are many dots there. X is of, often denoted phi and called the golden section. Leonardo da Vinci, the great Leonardo da Vinci, already he observed that the golden section is, is observed in a, in a well-proportioned human body. And in the Congress of Mathematics uh, Education in Seoul in 12, 2012, they had this kind of device that you, you can move it a little bit and the people can put the center um, move it that it will be in the novel, and then the upper <coughs> part versus the lower part satisfy the golden ratio, the golden section. It took me a lot of time to move all the other girls. They were very long lines <laughs> in order to be able to take a picture that you can see the, the device. Everything is to raise awareness to the existence of mathematics in your everyday life. But it's not only bodies, it's also in faces. In the past, it was believed that beauty depends on very precise uh, ratio between uh, vertical and, and horizontal. Vertical between A and B, <coughs> the edge of the mouse and the pupil, and the length of the face should be 0 0.36. And 
horizontal between the two pupils and the width of the face should be 0 0.46. Is this the secret of beauty? People, girls are asking themselves. Turns out that women known to be beautiful fail to satisfy this criteria. <laughs> On the other hand, in all culture, for men and women, <coughs> beauty is based on how closely one features reflect phi in their proportion. And it is hardwired into our being without even um, explaining to ourselves why we think that. Mm -hmm. And it's not a particular phi of certain ratio. It's certainly phi in the face. So it's already from antiquity. The goddess Athena has very precise golden section vertical and, and horizontal. But also in very modern faces, and you see men and women and different races, but there is no one specific shape or distance set that should uh, satisfy the golden section. It's as many golden sections in the face that exist, regardless of what. And it, hasn't, it doesn't have to be that one or that one. Once you have as many golden sections, then generally that's what you are considering. And it's also in a very refined place. It's not in the general face, a very refined <laughs> one. And it's also in animals. The dolphin we consider the old dolphin very beautiful. It has a lot of uh, golden section in it. And the tiger is also considered beautiful, and it has it there. And not to talk about the butterfly that sometimes is a symbol of beauty. And there's many, many, many uh, golden section there wherever you put this kind of scissor. They are they, this, uh, they're helping to, to determine the golden section. So this was the, for the appearance of the golden section. And that's, you might understand why the Renaissance artist called it the divine proportion. Because it appears so often. <coughs> So you hear a lot that beauty varies by race, culture, and era. And you many times say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But from now on, you don't say it anymore. <laughs> you say beauty is in the five. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm writing a book now with a journalist from the New York Times. I'm talking, she's writing. And the name of the book is Mathematics of Beauty. And this is the slogan of the book. And she said, I should never, never mention it before the book is out. Mm -hmm. But I really like Miami, so. <laughs> <laughs> OK, the next one is Fibonacci numbers. Where do we see Fibonacci numbers in, in nature? Fibonacci numbers is a series of numbers. Each of the numbers in the series is just a, a, a number. But together, they, they make the, the series. and. The property is that every number is the sum of the previous two ones. So 0 and 1 are random and maybe natural choice. And then 1 is 0 plus 1, 2 is 1 plus 1, 3 is 2 plus 1, 5, 3 plus 2, etc. A Fibonacci rectangle is a rectangle that the edges are two consecutive Fibonacci numbers. So 55 and 34 are the last two that you see on the, on the slide. The previous one is 34 and 21. Now, if you turn it 90 degrees, and then you, you can move it and put it in the big one, because the, the smaller edge of the bigger one is the bigger edge of the smaller one, so it fits inside. And what is left is left a square. So a Fibonacci rectangle is a square plus a smaller Fibonacci rectangle. Now you take this uh, rectangle, square, and a rectangle, and you put in the square that is left, you put a, a fourth of a circle. And then you do the same on the other Fibonacci rectangle, which is a smaller one, and you <coughs> take out from you a square, and you get an, a smaller, smaller rectangle. And you keep doing it. Take a square and get a smaller, smaller rectangle, and every time you do, a force of a circle. It's never the same radius. The radius is getting small, so it's not the same. But at the end, you get some kind of a spiral. And it turns out that these spirals appears in shells, in different shells, it appears in plants, in a cactus, in a rose, and in a sunflower 
uh, the very famous sunflower. You see it's not circles, inside it's this spiral. The third one, the third appearance, is, comes from two-dimension mathematical tiling. Uh, I go, I leave the tiling for a moment and I talk about crystals in nature. So solid structure in nature, minerals and stones, are called crystals. <coughs> and they are three-dimensional, that's the idea of, of, of this crystal. And they are atomically built, not what we see from the outside, from inside. They are atomically built with symmetry and periodicity. And the symmetry can be twofold if it's 180 degrees rotation or threefold or fourfold, sixfold. And it was believed that all solid structure in nature are atomically <coughs> built with symmetry and periodicity. No solid structure with symmetry and no periodicity. But in 1982, uh, Dan Schertman from the Technion in Israel, he predicted that there exists a nature-made aperiodic crystals. Uh, he was then assistant professor in an American university, and everybody in the world was laughing at him for uh, predicting that, and in the end, he lost tenure. So he came back to Israel, started from the beginning, but in 2009, aperiodic stones were found on a Russian mountain. Uh, the story goes with a small stone shop in Pisa, that something was found, and, but anyhow, it was found on a Russian mountain. So immediately, two years later, he got a Nobel Prize. <laughs> you cannot get a Nobel Prize if you don't have <coughs> an experiment to show your, your uh, theory. So well, that's why theoreticians cannot get a Nobel Prize. Actually, Schachtman did produce um, a quasi-crystal around 1984. Uh, from a, um, an alloy of manganese. But oil. then it, he explained to me that that wasn't natural. That, that was made in the lab. Yeah, it was and made that, in the lab. That's yeah, true. but he, yeah. It, uh, they talked about the natural made. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I should have mentioned that. Uh, <coughs> the new uh, structures are called quasi-crystals. So where is the math coming in the picture? <laughs> well, tiling. It comes from tiling. Tiling is covering a two-dimensional plane with no gaps and no overlaps. Wallpaper tiling respects symmetry and periodicity. For example, in this picture, if you turn it 180 degrees or 90 degrees, you get the same picture, and also it repeats itself. That's why it's called wallpaper. Wallpaper has to repeat itself, because the guy is cutting it in different places, and then it has to be the same in the whole, in the whole wall. Uh, and these tiling are known for centuries, uh, if, but there was no example of a wallpaper with symmetry and no periodicity. Uh, till in the 70s, Penrose constructed a tiling with symmetry and no periodicity that has this uh, five structure in the, in the picture. And uh, these were called uh, uh, Penrose um, uh, tiling. And short after that, uh, Schertmann uh, predicted the existence of, um, of um, uh, the quasi-crystals. And I asked him if, it was, uh, inf if he was influenced by that. And he said that uh, uh, it wasn't that he was influenced, but he heard that, that there is something in two dimensions. He thought it would be three dimensions. But he had other chemi uh, ideas in chemistry to produce it. But uh, for me, if he heard that there exists two, then he thinks there is three. This is what mathematics is about. You take two dimensions, you have some property in two dimensions, you test it in three dimensions and four dimensions. You come to five, there's always some counterexample, but uh, mm. this is what mathematicians are doing, and he did it. So a quasi-crystal should have in its pattern some polygon in its five uh, edges. And this is actually the three-dimensional ver version of uh, Penrose uh, type. I don't talk about, but you cannot do mathematics of entities without showing snowflakes, even though we are in mm. Florida. Uh, the last piece here is the mathematics of hair braids. <laughs> okay, Lida, uh, this is Lida by Leonardo. Leonardo comes again to the picture. He was really impressed by, uh, by braids. And uh, hair and, uh, this is Lida, and there are many, many dra other drawings. Uh, hair braids usually woven with three strands. This is a classical braid. But in mathematics, we also have two strands braids, four and five, and n strand braids. Uh, so in the modern, this is a strand braid, we think about the braid group of all the three, four strands of four, um, 
a brain group, a mixed brain brains like uh, this one, uh, is uh, of course can come of the inclusion of the different uh, brain group. Leonardo was also very fascinated, fascinated by the dynamic characterization of braid, and he has a series of drawings of braids transformed into water. And uh, the mathematician asking about this dynamic, how braids relate to each other, formed, ordered, factorized, and uh, the structure of the group is <coughs> all uh, braids. I studied it, as maybe mentioned here, and together with my student, we proved that one brain cannot be always deformed to another brain by conjugation. This is a very general, uh, uh, vague statement of the mathematics behind it. But then people say, OK, so how is it related to life? What does the result mean, the Lieberman result means for hair braids? I don't know. I decided it means that one needs to wash his hair, hair in order to make a new braid. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's it. so now we're coming to neuromedicine. Uh, is under our uh, title. So neuromedicine, first we have to know what do we know on the brain. So we know a lot on the brain. We know anatomy of the brain. We know that the brain has, uh, we know the different pieces of the brain. We gave names to the different pieces of the brain. Some of them exist, some of them we made the name. Then it's more uh, a picture from the side, a picture from inside. And we know that there are 10 to the 10 neurons in the, in the human brain. In one, it's a lot. A lot of neurons in human brain. So it's a very mixed forest. That's why it's not easy to understand how it works. We know there is white stuff <laughs> between the neurons. They give food to the brain. And uh, we know that a neuron is made from a, um, something went wrong. That the neuron is made from a, a, the axon and dendrites. So this is just one cell. And the dendrites are ve could be very long. It's approximately the shape of a, of a tree. Sometimes it, if it's a mathematical tree, it might not be a mathematical tree, but the shape of the tree. Dendrites are traveling very far. The motoric dendrites go down very far to the legs. So if it's a giraffe, it's very far. Mm -hmm. We know that the brain acts by synapse. That's the way that electricity is moving from one neuron to another neuron, and that's how the information is being transferred, and also how uh, uh, functions are being decided about. If there is a decision to raise the hand, so there's one place that I decide to raise my hand, and another place that I raise my hand. So there is a series of synapses between dec deciding and raising the, raising the hands. And these synapses are actually a biochemistry phenomena. And uh, the, we understand the neurotransmitters behind, the, behind it. We understand the firing rate, which is means the accumulation of all the synapses that are going into one neuron before <coughs> the, neuro, the neuron is firing back, when the tension of the boundary is too strong. We know that brain control motoric behavior, <coughs> reflexes, high brain functions, cognition, language, emotion, and we identify areas responsible for different, uh, uh, different uh, functions. And a lot of the research that's going on now is to identify the places where things are happening. <coughs> of course, we want to understand more than that. But to understand where something is happening is still a lot of research going on, especially in the emotional and the cognitive. Way. So when they raise the right hand, it fires in the left side and vice versa. But in fact, we don't know much. We know nothing about <laughs> how does the brain work. We don't know how does the network work as a whole. We don't understand how neurons <coughs> speak to each other. Which neuron, what are the roots? Which neurons, if I drink a glass of wine, a neuron dies always. So there is another one that takes over. What is the backup system of the neurons? We don't understand especially cognitive and emotional function. We know more about motoric. So we know, for example, to identify the neurons in charge of three of the fingers. It's a very slow motion. So 15 years ago, they only knew reaching. Now they also know grasping by three fingers. So two fingers still. So it's a very slow process. It will take another 100 years before we understand. And we ha language is the highest brain function. And we don't know how to handle a huge amount of data. So now it's called big data, this uh, issue. But 
Neuroscientists are doing big data for years already. They just didn't call it big data. They were just handling data. <coughs> Not uh, uh, biochemistry neuroscientists, but computational neuroscientists. <coughs> we localize the problem to a neural network, a set of neurons with action and rules, but we still, this is the, uh, this is a picture and some extra Photoshop of the visual cortex. So we look at a smaller piece of the 10 to the 10, but we still do not know how does the brain work. And it's still, in my eyes, the most intriguing question for the 21st century. To study the brain, we need to image from outside what is happening inside. What is brain imaging? First of all, some recording device of the electrical activity, then a forgetful factor. You have to forget what is irrelevant to the question that you ask. Like if we want to understand grasping, and there is also reaching there, so we have to take out the reaching. And a cleaning mechanism, the air condition might affect, the, the heart beeps might affect, so you have to clean mechanism. And the method that exists now are those that are listed. Intercellular recording is you put a microelectrode into the brain. It's not painful, and it records exactly from a neuron, from specific neurons. Uh, one does it on primates, because there are not many people that would volunteer, even though it's not so bad. Uh, and then the EEG is just electrodes on the brain. They, they don't record a, a, a certain synapse. They just do some averaging of what happens behind the electrode. So it's an integral, an averaging, and then you get something which you want to believe that it's what's going on downstairs, but it's really not, the, because that's what we have, so that's why we want to believe. One of my students did a PhD of changing, changing the EEG recording. But this is a very, it's not something that you earn money for, it's something that you lose money, because all the hospitals, they don't want to do it, to change everything, all the machines. And there is the PET scan of uh, brain, brain activity, it's like, it's like uh, x-ray, show <coughs> And the very new, newest uh, machine is the MEG. It detects the magnetic field induced by the electrical activity of the brain. And there are not so many in the world. They are very precise, but extremely uh, expensive. Uh, I work on one. I work on three machines, and each machine is a little bit different. One I worked in NYU in, uh, in Israel, and I work one now on one machine, the very advanced, the most advanced one in Abu Dhabi. So they record there, whatever I'll explain to you in a moment, <coughs> they send it to, to me and with my student, we analyze it and we give it back. So I thought it's a nice science for peace project. Uh, so you need a, d a smaller one for the head of a child. And uh, why do I put this uh, slide again? Because there is fMRI there in, in green light green, because fMRI is very much used, but it's not a brain imaging, because first you induce on the brain a very high magnetic field, and then you want to see what happens in the brain when it's induced. So it's called sort of invasive. It's not really recording. It's invasive, and then see what happens to it. So that's a, a different issue. OK, so now we come to Q. I, I said in the list that we have, uh, we have uh, to show Q, Q of epilepsy. Um, so epilepsy is a neurological disorder where you have seizures, and the seizure originates in some epileptic focus in the, in the brain. And 30% of the people that have this uh, disorder, uh, the medication that do not help. <coughs> so when medication do not help, you have to have a surgery you hope to have a surgery to take out the epileptic focus without causing too much harm yeah. to the rest of the brain. Uh, actually, epileptic is a very uh, widespread disorder, about 1% of the people. So it means if you take a double of the class here, or yeah. extra 40%, then we one with epilepsy. But we don't understand that it's epilepsy, because the strong thing is the seizure that we know. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's. 10 seconds that you lose contact with the environment. And this is considered part of, but you don't treat. You talk to someone, you think that you are boring <laughs> because he's gone for a moment, but then he's coming back. Um, so surgery is considered when the patient has only one epileptic focus and it's too much. Quality life is not good and also dangerous because when you fall, you might 
die from the fall. Uh, so how to identify the epileptic focus to take it out? So a prospective patient is subject to EEG text and MRI test, but not only EEG on the skull. They take out a piece of the scalp and they put the electrode on the brain. It's painless because there are no um, um, nerve there that can uh, feel it. But then the results are much better because the scalp is disturbing the, the recording. If there is agreement between the EEG raw data and the MRI findings, then the way is paved for surgery. But sometimes they disagree. And then you need another kind of algorithm to do it. And we developed uh, an algorithm to determine the epileptic focus and also to eliminate the need for a very invasive operation. This algorithm is used in Tel Aviv, in Michigan, in Chicago, and Los Angeles uh, in order to, to use it. And in Abu Dhabi, I don't know what to do after they get our results. Um, what are the steps in localizing the epileptic focus? First of all, you have to do the seizure me measurement, the EEG during a seizure. Then you do pre-processing. The inverse algorithm is where the mathematics is, and that's including the geometry of the brain model and source model and different mathematical models. And then you have to compare results with pathology. So you obtain the seizure measurement, and you obtain them because there is some automatic tool that identify the beginning of an ep uh, epileptic activity. You see in the beginning here, it's very, very close to each other. It almost doesn't look like weight. It almost looks um, attached to each other. And then the pre-processing to take away nose and to calculate the amount of epilepsy to see if it's worth making an operation. And here comes the EEG algorithm. So we have three types of algorithm. What you want is you have the outside recording and you want to understand what's coming in to map the electrical activity inside and find the location of the interesting phenomena like epilepsy. So I'll tell you a little bit, just a few slides about one of our methods, which is the genetic type algorithm. This is based on the mechanics of natural selection and, and, and genetics. It consists of selection, crossover, and mutation. So you start with initial data, some guesses to the solution of, the, of whatever you want. And then crossover, you take two points and you make from it one point in some method that you decide. Selection, you take the two best ones. And mutation, you create new points from, the, from those that left after the selection process. This is general genetic uh, algorithm. When it comes to uh, epilepsy, you have to adapt it to the brain. You have to decide what is the input, is a possible solution. Each comes with location, orientation, and amplitude. Uh, the mutation and crossover are based on the brain geometry, which is very complex. Head model and deep or fit which is source model. I don't say more about that. I just tell you that this is what we are doing. And then there is selection forward equation, and the uh, um, output comes again. And you repeat it again and again, as you see here. And eventually, the, as it says here, there is a stability of the process. You keep getting the same points again. So that means the end. This is the result of the algorithm. And of course, it takes <coughs> into, into consideration the time frame of um, epilepsy. This is a little bit more on the adaptation to the, to the brain. One of the easiest ways is to assume that the brain is a board, but this, of course, is as far as possible from reality. So you uh, know that it has a layered head model, realistic head model, and, and, and more than that. And then you test it on simulated data, and you compare results with pathology. And how do you know that you succeeded just with the clinical test? If the patient after the operation that was done with our algorithm is uh, having less seizures and they are less severe, and that's, that's a success. And then, uh, I think I have, um, because I, I still have time, because sure. I started Good. later. Uh, the next one is sleep disorder. Uh, compared to epilepsy, and since not every one of us has some kind of sleep uh, disorder, otherwise, you Maybe you cannot be a mathematician if you sleep enough. Uh, but this is much serious. It's considered one of the reasons for uh, a shorter life expectancy. Up to seven years, that's what the statistics said, if you don't sleep well. 
according to sleep rate. So sleep disorders of different kinds, some of them are, uh, in my family, for example, we all go to sleep late and come wake up late, but it comes to extreme that someone can have 25 hour cycles, so it changes all the time. Uh, but the main sleep disorder that uh, this uh, the work that I will report is, is too many arousals. You wake up in the middle of the night and you don't even know it and you fall asleep again. But if there are too many of these, there's not enough oxygen to the brain and you are tired during the day, so you fall asleep during the day, that's no good. It could be uh, come to half of the sleep that you need. Um, so the main goal, and we have two main goals. One, a prediction of pre-sleeping behavior. This was funded by Fiat. They wanted to put something in the car that will tell you when you are going to fall asleep before your eyes are closing and the car is in the tunnel. Uh, but when Fiat emerged with uh, Chrysler, I think, yes. Americans didn't want any device in the car that can be sued for that if it doesn't work well. So we stopped, but we continued. And then also prediction of arousals to see why predictions? Because to really know arousals, you have to sleep in the laboratory with the EEG on your head, and it's ex it's unpleasant, a very expensive process to put everybody. But if you can see some correlation between arousals and other channel, that is very good. So the experiment, you do simultaneous measure of the following channels. Here are 12 channels, sorry for the Hebrew. Here are 12 channels, but actually there are 16 channels. It's the EEG, it's the EFG, which is the muscles, EKG, eye, eye movement, leg movement, pulse saturation, all these, uh, all these together. GSR is uh, the electricity of the skin, which is uh, very indicative, apparently. So these were the two main goals. But the main tool is to find relationship between the GSR and these other three measures. So EEG recording and sleep research are classified by frequency, amplitude, and the shape. So these are the different frequencies. Uh, these are the different shapes. And, uh, and then together we get sleep stages that are also um, have to do with the other channels, not only the EEG. The most important is the REM, the rapid eye movement. Um, the whole cycle takes one and a half hours in most people, but the REM is the last 20 minutes. The last 20 minutes is, um, uh, is very important. There is a, <coughs> there is an experiment with a cat. The cat was waken up before he gets into REM, and after two weeks, the cat died. And how do you know that it's going into REM? Because you see the rapid eye movement. So, uh, so this is the most important. And if you don't have enough of REM, you are in trouble. So we did uh, geometric data mining on different channels in order to see which channels are connected to another channel. Uh, this, of course, <coughs> is a very long work. I'm just telling you uh, that's what we did. And then uh, each confrontation is carries a grade, which we call a bit. This allows us to have a probability, and then it's data mining plus probability. We also did it on four channels simultaneously. And uh, when we did this uh, pair <coughs> confrontation, this button confrontation, of not on the raw data, but the output of the data mining um, process, where you see events are confronted with high probability. And then we got the result of the pulse versus, versus saturation and the pools versus uh, GSR, and this is still a uh, work in uh, progress. Uh, I hope I uh, have three minutes just to say on the most important thing, how does the brain work? So conjecture on the way the brain works are the following. Chaos firing rate plasticity. Chaos, some people say, well, it's random. God did something and it happens. And some, that's why some people exist and some did not. Firing rate is what I explained before. And plasticity is the way that the brain adjusts when there is a damage. Like I say, drinking a glass of wine, and then there is a new neuron that is doing the work. Uh, synchronization is, uh, synchronization is uh, uh, the method, the theory that contradicts firing rate. That it says it's impossible that only the accumulation of the firing causes a neuron to fire and the deltas are not important. Mm -hmm. 
So that's what it is. Synchronization means that the delta is important. Compositionality goes with synchronization. It's what is the smallest atom in the brain activity. And scene fire chain is the final solution, still a conjecture. What, what is the, how does the brain work? If we have some experiment for scene fire chain, it will be a Nobel Prize. And in, in the paper, spike synchronization and head motion, uh, our goal was to find unknown relationship that are not related to the firing rate. To, so it means to disprove the firing rate. And in fact, we did it. We created a new engine in geometric data mining and used probability and stochastic for algebraic geometers. Stochastic was uh, something I had to learn, not only how does the brain anatomy of the brain, worked on data from behaving monkeys. You, you have to work on real data, otherwise you don't really know what happened, because models you can do. And show that the brain is more sophisticated than firing rate, and synchronization does exist. So indeed, the monkey was making drawings. We collected the data of the brain from eight microelectrodes during the monkey did, and we did this uh, flow chart. Uh, that uh, we confronted the information from the brain data and the hand data. And now I told myself to jump here. There's no time to jump to 1.30, so I'm jumping to 1.30. And it doesn't go to 1.30. And uh, we did, yeah, we did that, this experiment of comparing on the real data from the brain and on jitter data. Jitter data that a little bit moved, a little bit. It's not easy to produce 5,000 jitter data, but it's jittered less than the firing rate. So that's why it was, uh, uh, it was a counterexample to the firing rate. And from all these uh, 5,000 jitter data, we put it there, uh, the distribution of the result or the score. I told you every day has a score to see how much um, synchronization there is in that day. And uh, we found where is the score of the original data. And the score of the original data was here. So that was a great success. Because if the original data would be in the head of the curve, of course it's nothing. But even if it would be here, even if it would be here, it might be a little bit understanding, but certainly not publishable. Maybe here it would be publishable. But <laughs> Here, it was a great success and was accepted by the <coughs> community, which wasn't easy because they worked on firing rate for their entire life. So this was accepted by community that synchronization exists. So and none of the 5,000 jitter data reached the original score. So we had uh, this window of surprise versus jittering window, and we found the significance of 0.2%. And it spikes whole information in a time resolution of three milliseconds. That's what we found out. And we had, unfortunately, to do it with the second monkey also, because I didn't know, I'm not a biologist. I didn't know that you, when you send a paper to a biology paper, you have to do it on two monkeys. Because if you prove that there is an elephant that speaks English, so there is an elephant that speaks English, why do you have to prove the statement there is an <laughs> elephant that speaks English? But that wasn't good. To say there is only one monkey, we had to do one monkey, and the guy got his PhD one year later. <laughs> but we proved what we wanted. It was even less than three milliseconds. And the end, I put a, a question mark, because it's not really the end. We still have to work a lot in order to understand how does the brain work. Thank you. Questions? How does the brain work? <laughs> yep. Sorry. Why do you need to do the experiments on the monkey? Sorry? Why do you need to do the experiments on the monkeys? Because, because people don't you? volunteer to do food. Yeah. <laughs> How because they have to open their skull? You have to not open. You put microelectrodes into the brain of the monkey when he does the drawing. Oh. And if you, because whenever you do a model, it's just not real data, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. So in order to understand, you have to go to a real button. It's not fun. It's not fun. But the monkeys are very well treated. They work four hours a day only. They have a living room. They have a study. They have a bedroom. The students from the art department did drawings all over the walls. They have uh, windows. 
And that's their job. The job is to sit four hours and make drawings and drink juice when the drawing is very nice. My monkey, I didn't show you the picture, he liked cusps. So I so thought that's a nice twist, that my monkey would like cusps. <laughs> Other questions? Well, yes, yes, please, 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 please. I'm, I'm going to do a more specialized talk. There was a lot of uh, statistical analysis going into it. Some things look like time series. Maybe well, next time when I'm in Miami. Next time in next Miami. Next time in Miami, not, not now, not this time. No, this time. The conference is <laughs> very, very strict. Yes. yes. Well, one of the things that I've always puzzled when people do recordings from from uh, um, from the monkey cortices, um, there is so much recurrent. There's so, there's so <coughs> recurrent circuits across the cortex. So there are there, and and so how do how do, how do you approximate that in a model where where you don't know how many additional inputs there because are? Because these microelectrodes. They touch the neuron. They are only the microelectrode is only recording from eight neurons around it. And since we know where the motor cortex is, I told you we, do, we know reaching. We don't know grasping. So we put it exactly into the motor cortex, and we know we have a list of the neurons. This is a very um, enlightening that with 32 neurons we could make this uh, proof that there is a synchronization. But what you are asking about the overall activity of the brain, that's a general question. When you do from outside, the EEG, you don't know what the EEG is recording also, not only that. So part of the challenge is to do this pre-processing, to take out whatever is not, is not relevant, or spike sorting. It's, it's not easy, but uh, it's being, a lot of it is conjecture, but some of it is, is real data that you already know where is it coming from. But it's, it's an extremely important question. It's the main challenge in neuroscience. Other questions? Or well, if not, stay with me again.